Hello, everyone. Good evening. Uh, thank you, Yogius, for that very warm and um, uh, very kind uh, introduction. I'm delighted and honored to be part of this lecture series, How Our World Became Christian. Christian Christianization has been, as mentioned, uh, one of the key questions uh, in the field of late antiquity, as we all know. I, I didn't actually know uh, the, the nature of this audience, so I think we're all uh, experts here, so I, I would probably be uh, generalizing a little bit too much uh, uh, for, for this audience. Okay. Uh, the interdisciplinary scope of any investigation into the topic of Christianization has brought together scholars from a variety of disciplines, from textual and literary scholars to epigraphers to students of material culture, art history and archaeology. It's wonderful that some of us some of you wear more than one of these hats, uh, particularly I was thinking of Georgios and others who have worked on topics such as the reception of pagan statuary and the scope and limitations of the graphic material for under and archaeological material for understanding what Christianization entailed in a localized particular setting. This gives more nuance to the whole question and uh, balances against the overarching narratives we we'll often find in scholarship, uh, dating, of course, all the way back to uh, Gibbon and beyond. And I'm thinking also of the, um, the modern iterations of Gibbon, such as uh, Catherine Nixie's uh, book, The Darkening Age, Christian Destruction of the Classical World, um, which, of course, turns the old, late antique Christian narrative of triumphalism on its head and goes back to the theme of violence and destruction uh, of the classical heritage as particular uh, as a particular uh, kind of uh, um, ca uh, particularly uh, notable character uh, 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 a feature of Christianization and so on. Um, the cover, of course, shows the head of Athena, uh, who's been rudely Christianized, so to speak, with an inscribed cross. And this goes very well with Nixie's book treatment, which connects. I'm sorry, uh, shouldn't be this. I'm sorry, it's out of order. Okay, I was meaning to show an image of uh, uh, of, uh, of Theophilus uh, taking the Serapeum apart and so on. But in any case, um, this whole set of image uh, image. Uh, is very familiar to most of us and so on. Um, this particular type of narrative, uh, I think, uh, puts the process criticization into a very stark contrast. It presents it as one of conflict, contestation of zero sum uh, uh, winning and losing, so to speak, and so on. Um, but also know, uh, and I think we'll be investigating that tonight, um, many more aspects of traditional culture were not treated in this particular way. Many continued in varying uh, capacities with varying degrees of so-called Christianization. And many even proved to be not capable of being sanctified in a meaningful way, being Christianized in a specific way, and remained acceptable nonetheless as neither Christianized nor considered pagan, but as this other category of the secular. So tonight I hope to share some ideas uh, that uh, uh, about basically how comedic theater uh, fits the bill to some extent uh, in this particular context. Okay. So to Roman spectacles. Uh, most of us are, again, very familiar with this. I'm just using this particular example from the Consul Diptych of uh, Flavius Natasius Probus uh, to kind of demonstrate the importance of public spectacles to the whole edifice of Roman life, including in this particular case, the inaugural event of a, on, an ordinary consul. Um, the The consul is shown uh, about to throw the mappa, which is the napkin to start a race in the hippodrome. And on the un 
on the on the bottom register of the diptychs, you actually see the scenes of the games that he's prepared and produced uh, for the amusement of the Roman people uh, in Constantinople uh, and so on. And you can see on the left hand side the games of the uh, Hippodrome on the top with the horses with placards of the names and then below you have theatrical shows and I'll come back to this later. And on the right hand side you see of course the games in the amphitheater uh, quite dramatic and so on. So these three types of games uh, in some sense um, are the quintessential uh, kind of triad, if you will, of Roman public spectacles. Of course, they, they're not limited to these. Uh, they're also athletic contests and other types of uh, uh, events, uh, but uh, I will mainly confine my remarks to these and so on. Okay, we'll come back to these later on. Um, what I'd like to do also is to propose that when we talk about uh, questions such as Christianization and secularization, uh, in respect to the cultural spectacles, we should always keep in mind the different groups, and these are kind of generic, generalized groups, uh, and these groups, uh, points of view, and so on. Uh, and I'll just kind of go through a very rough schematic of these. They're the sponsors of the games, uh, including individuals such as this particular consul and people who were curiales and others, and so on, uh, or city councillors. Uh, they paid for the shows, they produced the shows, and the shows in some sense was part of the exchange with the people uh, uh, for status, acclaim, and so on. Um, what was their role and agency throughout the, those processes of Christianization and secularization? Um, the second group, of course, were the audience. Um, the audience here barely visible. Uh, you can see them a little bit on the right hand side in uh, these in these heads that appear uh, on the top of the amphitheater and so on. They were mainly urban inhabitants uh, for these spectacles and uh, increasingly Christian and certainly by the sixth century in Constantinople imagine them to be mostly Christian and so on. The other groups, uh, the third group, uh, the performers themselves, those who actually uh, were responsible for reducing the spectacle, enacting them, and so on. Um, I'm sorry, is that noise? Okay. Um, charioteers, actors, gladiators, uh, animal fighters, uh, and so on. Um, and we know something about them, um, and I'll talk about that in a minute. Um, the fourth group, is the group that we tend to learn the most about this ancient culture uh, and that is to say that those who are critical of it and those who actually wrote uh, uh, large numbers of volumes against it and these included uh, philosophers and increasingly of course also Christian writers who themselves often drew on uh, philosophical topoi uh, to, uh, to engage in a polemic against the games and so on. And I'll leave aside a fourth group, which were probably Christians who also devised alternative forms of spectacles or otherwise incorporated a cultural spectacle in particular types of uh, 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 cultural forms that were meant to be for the consumption of the Christian community and so on. Okay, so the first two groups, uh, the sponsors and the spectators, were historically speaking the most important in terms of the reproduction of the cultural spectacles. Their points of view can only, however, be inferred through particular historical accounts, through particular laws, through material culture and archaeology and so on. And of course, through the fact of they're continuing to invest in the games through uh, payment for the games and attendance at the games. The groups the second group and the third group uh, comprising the spectators and the performers were often fairly mute in the historical evidence uh, in terms of not having much of their own point of view being presented. Uh, we do have some sort of gravestones of performers and so on, um, but they're most, more often than not ascribed traits and characteristics by others and so on. Uh, including by people in the first group and the fourth group. Now, the fourth group were the ones 
who wrote against the culture of public spectacle uh, and so on. Uh, some of them to Aquarian law, so uh, some of it could uh, have a lot of important information, um, but they often have a particular axe to grind and we're very familiar uh, uh, about this particular uh, tendency in particularly patristic literature and so on. Now this fourth group, uh, it sort of in a sense uh, has an importance of course in the, in the tradition of scholarship because they produce so much, so much is preserved. Uh, and we tend to write about the cultural public spectacles through the lens of these so-called church fathers and so on. But in terms of the actual agency in shaping contempt the contemporary world that they inhabited, we I think one can probably say that that influence was relatively marginal compared to certainly the first and the second group of people and so on. Okay. Now those uh, however, as I said, that particular group, the fourth group uh, of critics, were particularly influential in shaping our perceptions of the games, and they create the whole uh, I think conceptual framework often for discussing this particular uh, uh, culture of the public spectacles. Uh, they produce a particular triad, uh, philosophers and Christian writers, uh, that these games uh, could be categorized according to the spaces in which they were uh, featured. That is to say, the uh, amphitheater, the hippodrome, and the uh, theater. And that each of these spaces were predominantly uh, the places where specific kinds of emotional dispositions were produced. Cruelty in the case of the amphitheater, madness in the case of the hippodrome, and less physical, less lasciviousness, forgive the, uh, the uh, uh, lasciviousness uh, from watching the sensuous dances uh, or pantomimes in particular in the theater and so on. Now the theaters in this particular normal accusation, oh sorry, oh yeah, that's what it is, I'm so sorry, okay, um, and thank you very much. The, the theatre tends to be spoken about in connection with one of those two main groups of performers who populated the Roman and late Roman stage. These two were the pantomimes and the mimes, and I'll speak about them more in a, in a moment. Um, interestingly, the theatre is mainly associated in the diatribe against uh, theatrical shows by critics uh, 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 through the uh, criticism against the pantomimes and so on, rather than the mimes. Uh, and and I'll therefore try to focus our attention on the mimes uh, in order to kind of see why they get perhaps slightly less attention, though they did get some attention as well and so on. Okay. Now at one point, a Byzantine has actually even suggested that because later on the Christian church came to appropriate aspects of the mime shows in its, its liturgical services, it reconciled itself to mime performances so much so that it, um, it had fewer issues with it and so on. And this view has generally been somewhat uh, rejected or, or sort of corrected, uh, but I will come back to it later on and ask questions about how the mime shows and how they fit in within kind of Christianizing society's outlook uh, as compared to some of the other forms of spectacles and so on. Okay. All right. So, um, so the next uh, section uh, is deals with, oh, I'm sorry, this was out of place and so on. Okay. Deals with um, comedy as stage performances. Now, not all comedy were stage performances because uh, they were also uh, a sort of literary works. They were also comedy were also uh, produced in domestic settings, so not all in theatrical contexts and so on. Okay, so I wonder it's just the overall context. Now, most everyone here is familiar with classical Greek tragedies and comedies. Uh, the latter being represented by the corpus of Aristophanes the old comedy and of course uh, Menander's new comedy. Uh, these tended to be uh, parts of dramatic uh, 
religious festivals. Uh, they were parts of religious uh, kind of agonistic competitions uh, from the city Dionysia to many other types of festivals throughout the uh, Hellenic and later on the Hellenistic and the Roman world and so on. Um, Hellenistic uh, plays, the Hellenistic plays of Menander uh, became much more prominent over time and tended to displace at least in terms of being uh, produced on the theatre uh, uh, as compared to those of Aristophanes and so on. Um, over time, however, these plays became, of course, uh, also uh, ones that circulated as literary works outside of the performative contexts. And both Aristophanes and Menander uh, became literary greats and visual representations of them and of them singularly or together uh, were common. Uh, and we of course have this famous example from the house of Menander in Pompeii uh, and other ones, Menander and so on, uh, these reliefs. Um, and they often appear uh, in literary uh, texts uh, in connection with tragedic poets such as Euripides and Sophocles and so on. Okay. Now, Menander's play uh, were. Okay. Okay. Come back to Menander. The Menander's plays continue to be produced uh, through the Roman and the late antique period, uh, though perhaps with increasing uh, uh, emphasis on them being produced less in the theatre than in private homes. And uh, they seem to be sort of parallel contexts in which these plays appeared and so on. And Plutarch does mention the, the three main contexts in which uh, 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 sort of um, um, performances, if you will, of, of comedy would take place in the during the second sophistic, that is to say, in the theatre, uh, in the grammarian schoolroom, where they would be kind of through declamation and so on, and in the symposium and so on, where sort of small parts of them might be reenacted and so on. Um, Okay. So the partial summary is that comedy as a, uh, as sort of in the form of new comedy in particular, uh, was relevant in the, uh, in the late antique period, but it was not the predominant way in which uh, 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 the spectacles were uh, produced. Uh, that is to say, comedic performances on the Roman stage was not predominantly uh, the production of these uh, highly literary pieces and so on. So instead what we have are hybrid forms of mime comedy and they ranged in, uh, in terms of their complexity, in terms of the degree of uh, uh, how, how, how plotted they were, how scripted they were, um, from, uh, from being highly scripted to being completely improvised perhaps uh, stage skits with uh, improvised dialogue and slapstick uh, interactions between the minds and so on. The uh, importance discovery uh, of the Corinthian and uh, the Mokituria mimes uh, from Oxyrhynchus uh, were particularly important. The Corinthian mime uh, has the eponymous hero um, Caritian shipwrecked in India uh, and she then had a series of adventures in uh, India including Amazon combats uh, involved hilarious dialogue that featured uh, speakers speaking in supposedly Indian tongues uh, and so on uh, whereas uh, the other one uh, Moturia is the typical adult uh, adultery mime with the cuckolded husband uh, young woman and her lover and so on. Um, these can both be read as exemplar, exemplars of the kinds of mimes that were common in the imperial period and also in the late antique period. 
they were not the same as the uh, mimes of Menanda in the sense that they were much more, um, even though they employed many you know, of the same plot lines, uh, they were much less literarily uh, uh, accomplished. Uh, they didn't have any verse in them, and they were meant uh, to be, in some sense, readily understood by uh, the, in this case, Oxyrhynchus uh, audience, that is to say, the uh, inhabitants of a middling provincial town in Roman Egypt and so on. Um, now, there were other types of mime plays, including highly literary ones like Herontas's uh, Mimemics, uh, but I will pass over these. Uh, Plutarch, uh, uh, in one famous passage, mentions the whole range of uh, mime shows from very highly plotted ones, like, like, uh, uh, like perhaps these, these ones, uh, to uh, all the way down to uh, skits and so on. And those particular uh, uh, ones with skits are ones that we often do associate with mimes uh, in Roman theatres, late Roman theatres, not necessarily even these highly scripted mimes. There are a lot of debates as to which type of mime plays were more prevalent and so on. Now, both the um, new comedy of Menander and their uh, sort of latter day uh, um, uh, uh, interpretations, as well as the uh, so more popular minds involved uh, characters who wore masks. Uh, and in this particular case, this late third century uh, Roman mosaic from Daphne. Um, and this particular uh, mosaic could either suggest the, the performance of Menander's play, or it's really in some sense the self-representation of the house owner as wanting to be seen as a cultured individual, someone who uh, was uh, very much rooted in the Hellenic tradition and so on. Now, in regards to the, uh, to the, uh, the mask, I'd like to just go to Pulux of Naucratis's catalog of the types of uh, dramatic mass that a well, particularly well-equipped uh, troupe of performers could be expected to have. Uh, and this is from basically around the second century of the common era and so on. Um, they should have eight tragic masks, six for old men, eight for young men, three for slaves, 11 for women. There were three masks for satyrs or pass over these. There were 44 comedic masks uh, not quite double, but uh, but quite a lot more. Uh, nine for old men, eleven for young men, seven for slaves, three for old women, five for young women, seven for courtesans, and two for young female attendants. And these masks were clearly meant for very elaborate, uh, plotted, scripted plays and so on. Um, okay, so this was not meant to be. Okay, All right. Um, However, we do have, of course, much more uh, straightforward types of mind plays where uh, a smaller cast of characters uh, might be uh, acting out uh, physical comedy and, and, uh, and a much more simplified type of uh, 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 sort of dialogue and so on. Uh, mind actors increasingly presented themselves as bold headed. Uh, individuals, either these were masks in some cases, or sometimes they would choose particular actors who would have these physical features and so on. These were adult males. And this is, again, very commonly associated with the mime shows of the Roman and late Roman period and so on. And, and this is just to, in some sense, suggest the, the range of uh, what passes as comedic performance in a Roman theater throughout this particular period. And, uh, and also the varying degrees of connection between the comedic stage and the literary uh, comedies uh, that we connect to Aristophanes and Menander and so on. Now, this particular type of more uh, uh, lowbrow, if perhaps, mine uh, uh, invoked everyday occurrences and which much more slapstick and so on. And we know somewhat about this also from incidental comments in various works and so on. All right. So I'd like to sort of pass on to um, 
Okay, here's another uh, representation of mine performance from Sabrata from in Libya. Okay. All right. Oh, here's yet another one. Okay. You can I see it there? And sometimes this has been uh, this particular image, just to kind of incidental comment, was used at one point to suggest that in late antiquity, the the mime shows and the pantomime shows were uh, moving a little bit uh, out of the theater and moving into the hippodrome uh, because this is where they seem to appear on the diptych and so on. Um, the evidence for this is is not entirely conclusive. It could well be, and there's evidence for medley shows during chariot races uh, and you know during the intermissions and so on. You'd have various types of performances, but in this particular case, it seems this particular image is clearly not uh, good evidence for that transition because it's in some sense just trying to. Uh, um, symbolically capture the whole range of spectacles that Anastasia has paid for uh, for, his, for his consul inauguration and so on. Okay. All right. All right. So, all right. So for the next sections, I'm going to actually be speaking less about on the slides and, and just mainly from from uh, from uh, uh, from from the text. I'm commenting on the text and so on. Okay. Now, how does the rise of Christianity on the comedic stage intersect. Um, Tatian, uh, in his address to the Greeks, uh, chastises fellow Romans for the love of classical plays, the plays of Euripides, of Aristophanes and Menander and so on. Uh, as a Christian sophist, he was nonetheless engaged uh, with finding a form of Christian paideia that somehow sidesteps this particular reliance on traditional authors and their works and so on. Okay. So this particular, uh, this particular way of seeing comedy as, or traditional comedy as an antithetical to Christian values it is there, but it's not in many ways a, uh, either a majority view or a, a very strong trend. Uh, of course, we also have compromises that were made or accommodations that were made uh, by Christian intellectuals, if you will, who found solutions to accommodate uh, uh, a Greek idea within the scheme of Christian education, uh, such as we see in Basil Caesarea's address to young men on the right use of Greek literature and so on. The idea being that uh, so long as you uh, learn the classical text for the right reasons, that is to say, try to learn uh, how to master the Greek language and so on. That is a very permissible way of uh, accommodating yourself to the classical heritage and so on. Um, now, this particular um, uh, um, argument, therefore, over uh, the validity of comedy for Christians uh, is not really a very um, um, prominent strand in the actual interactions between Christians and the Roman stage. And as we also saw earlier, uh, the, Ro the Roman comedic stage was also not so directly linked to these literarized uh, comedies in the first place and so on. Okay. Now, another place where um, Christians and the culture of the Roman comedic stage intersected was in terms of the values that were promoted, were thought to be promoted on the stage. Uh, philosophers and Christians cared about the uh, effect of particular performances or spectacles on the human soul. Uh, the, spent, the time that was spent uh, on these shows was itself a distraction from more serious philosophical or religious pursuits and so on. Um, there were long treatises on the ill effects uh, on the emotions, on, on one's mental and spiritual disposition from attending the shows and so on. So therefore, uh, that itself, the philosophical and the moral aspect of spectacles, including comedic theater, became one of the places where tensions between Christianity 
and the community stage uh, emerged and so on. And there's a whole, of course, as I mentioned, this is, uh, of course, the whole line of attack that would be adopted by uh, Christian writers and they constitute the, the bulk of those who wrote about many of these spectacles. And of course, there are very long treatises and, and arguments about these. I, I won't uh, be concerned with documenting every major instance of this, obviously. Um, just want to mention, however, that this particular objection was nonetheless still directed more at the theatrical performances of the pantomimes than that of the mimes. Now, the pantomimes are the ones uh, who uh, uh, engaged in uh, uh, dances. Uh, they acted out uh, classical uh, uh, themes drawn from mythology and tragedies. They reenact mythological characters with their physical gestures uh, to music and, 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 and a chorus. Uh, and they often would reenact female characters and in that particular uh, context, they, they promote a kind of uh, desire in the audience that was seen as particularly disturbing to those who objected to their craft and so on. Now, to what extent would mimes also fall into that particular category? Um, and so on. Okay. Um, generally speaking, you could say that mimes, particularly the adultery mime, could also be uh, ob morally objectionable. But generally speaking, mimes promoted not the serviousness, sorry, uh, or desire, but more uh, laughter, uh, maybe a sense of derision or mockery uh, and sort of, of things that were played out on stage. Uh, this was less uh, immediately uh, objectionable, perhaps, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the moralists uh, who were concerned about these issues. So just to quickly sum up, the concerns over the pantomimes were very uh, uh, considerable. Uh, they were uh, also, pantomimes were considered much more like celebrities and so on, high status at some level, uh, certainly uh, celebrities and heroes in some cases, they were the objects of contests by circus factions and the theatrical factions that extended the rivalry to their championship of particular pantomimes and so on. So, so the pantomimes became uh, uh, sort of those great heroes just as charioteers were in late antiquity and even who was selected as the pantomime of a particular faction uh, could become the occasion of a great riot in this case uh, it was a great riot in Rome in 509 where many people were actually killed and so on over the selection of the uh, chief pantomime and so on. So the idea with the pantomime elicited very dangerous and very strong emotions and therefore uh, their role is much more uh, uh, suspicious and perhaps resented by others who also wanted to compete with them uh, and thinking sometimes of Christian uh, speakers who wish that they had some of the uh, effect on the audience as pantomimes were said to have on theirs as well and so on. Okay. So what about the comedic stage uh, and what about the mimes who uh, performed also in the theatre? Now the mimes, unlike the pantomimes, uh, were much more ridiculous characters. Uh, they were not necessarily ones that the spectators were encouraged or moved to admire as they would the pantomime they would not necessarily treat them either as heroes in the same way as a pantomime or a charity and so on. Uh, there are much fewer, or there's very little by way of the, uh, sort of faction rivalry over a mime actor uh, as compared to a pantomime or a charity and so on. And you don't really hear much about mime riots as opposed to pantomime riots or circus riots and so on. After all, Supposedly, the comedic theater was about making people laugh uh, and so on. And we'll come back to the question of laughter, of course, in a minute. Okay, so that whole issue of the moral uh, effect of the comedic theater was, was, was a factor, but in some sense, it also was much less of a factor than, say, the effect that watching chariot games and watching pantomimic shows were said to have 
on their respective audiences, which, and these effects could lead all the way to violent riots, uh, which was not necessarily the case with the mime shows uh, and so on. Now, another uh, possible objection is that uh, uh, participating in the theater, the comedic shows, encourage the audience to pay homage to false gods in argument uh, about idolatry. And, uh, and this is actually not necessarily a very strong argument in the sense that we don't see uh, uh, divine figures featuring very much in at least the less scripted forms of mime shows. Sometimes they might appear in the mechanism of Deus Ex Machina, but otherwise not very prominent and so on. Nonetheless, uh, you have uh, people making sort of elliptical comments. Uh, uh, for instance, Salvian uh, in his On Governance uh, of God uh, said that Christians were not spared the madness of the shows in the theater in this case, because they preferred the words of mime actors to those of Christ, which is kind of interesting comment, you know, that it, it's not the, um, it's not the charities he's comparing to. Madness usually paired with charities, but here madness for the words of the uh, mimes and so on. Um, okay, all right. Now I want to say just a quick uh, word about the mimes themselves, uh, the personnel who furnish uh, the performance or, or made possible the performance and so on. We know quite a fair bit uh, from uh, epigraphic material and from papyri and other sources uh, and so on uh, about some of these mimes. Uh, also from Roman law, we know that mimes, just like many other performers, when they performed in public, they suffered from uh, infamy or infamia. They, they lose their civic status and certain civic rights and so on. Uh, mimes were typically members of traveling troops and so on, so, so that, that also means that their, their whole families uh, were suffered this particular kind of marginalized uh, existence, but of course that is only seen from a very elite point of view and probably in real life did not affect the actual livelihoods uh, or the life ways of actual individuals so much and so on. In the late antique period, from the time of Diocletian to Constantine, uh, many uh, essential professions were made hereditary in nature, uh, sorry, that used to be even hereditary in practice, were made hereditary in law, and theatrical performance was one of them. Uh, so uh, we could uh, say, therefore, that mimes in particular uh, were uh, uh, sort of made a hereditary profession, and this has a particular interesting outcome in late antiquity because for those who might want to find a way out of this hereditary obligatory service, uh, conversion to Christianity became a particularly attractive option. And we know about this from various laws in the late fourth century going into the early fifth century, and also in uh, writings of, for instance, Augustine of Hippo, where mimes sought uh, baptism there's an argument about whether a baptized individual could actually perform on stage and eventually it was you know basically decided they they could not and so on so that eventually led to this particular uh, 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 intersection between mime shows and christianity on the level of the social mobility of the personnel being able to uh, basically transfer the allegiance from one type of activity being mimes to being a, in this case, a being a baptized Christian and so on. Uh, but of course we know that this really uh, was not necessarily something that was conclusively changing the nature of these or any of these professions. Many of these uh, acting and performative professions were still roughly speaking hereditary in nature over time. Of course, with the famous example of the family of Later on, the Empress Theodora is a very nice case in point, and we'll come back to that perhaps in a minute. Okay, so in the remaining time that I have, I'd like to turn our attention to uh, uh, how the audience uh, 
uh, of spectacles and particularly of comedic shows was became the sort of focal point of some of these Christian writings and so on. Okay. Um, now the um, the two main authors I like to focus on are uh, Caricius of Gaza. Uh, from 491 to 518, a Christian retor and a sophist, uh, also very much an establishment person who was active in the public affairs of the city. Uh, and he uh, wrote a very famous work that is an imitation uh, or a compliment to Libanius's defense of dances. Uh, his work is on the defense of the mimes and so on. And particularly he defended the mimes themselves against charges of immorality and effeminacy. Uh, they argue that uh, they, their characteristic, they themselves were not affected by, uh, by the taking on these particular roles on stage. And in addition, and by extension, a priori, the, um, the spectators were also not affected by watching these performances and so on. Their character, their characters, uh, the performance, uh, the performances before them would not so change their fundamental character, uh, their moral character, uh, so that they would even go to the go to the length of actually uh, imitating or wanting to imitate some of the things that they see enacted on stage, such as such as comedic adultery, for example, and so. On. So his argument basically is that human nature uh, is immutable from birth and cannot be changed, including not uh, when you simply put on the mask, assuming the persona, uh, the prosopon of, uh, of an actor on stage or by wearing a particular theatrical costume and so on. So this is a particular place where a Christian retor was trying to, in some sense, uh, make some interesting arguments about the interaction between spectacles and the audience and basically saying that the audience was not really fundamentally corrupted uh, by the shows that they see and so on. And you could say perhaps Caricius was more on the one hand trying to kind of um, follow in the footsteps of Libanius and show his paideia and on the other hand also to defend uh, his own uh, practices as an orator, as somebody who declaimed uh, on classical themes where he might be accused of himself reenacting certain types of mythological characters in a not particularly acceptable way to other Christians and so on. Okay. Now the other character, uh, the other figure I'd like to bring into uh, uh, the picture is uh, Jacob of Saruk. Uh, where he wrote on the reception of the holy mystery. So he's writing not about mimes, but on basically on, uh, particularly on the Eucharist and, and so on. Okay. So this is where the, uh, uh, where he actually would uh, introduce a particular comment uh, that people who, instead of being in church, would go elsewhere and accept uh, the opportunity to view other forms of spectacles or opening themselves to very bad moral influences. Um, so basically saying that, you know, whatever you see, you become that which you see and so on. So among the examples that he gives is basically how, how the mime shows affect the, the human soul and so on. Okay, so when she hears, she being the human soul, hears the songs and jests of the actors, uh, she becomes very uh, uh, sort of, how do you call it, wanton, she becomes very desirous of sexual encounter and so on. Uh, and, and, and that she then with a loud voice, uh, she would uh, kind of make known her own wantonness. You know, basically she's both sexually uh, kind of animated and she would use her laughter to exhibit that particular form of laughter and so on. Okay. Uh, so this is in some sense a counter argument to uh, what uh, Caricius was saying. Okay. Now, uh, this is more of an aside uh, because we 
the, the information is a bit patchy. Uh, to what extent was uh, the theater of the mime itself something that actually was brought into Christian liturgical services or Christian uh, sort of church dramas in the Byzantine period and so on? Okay. Um, there are difficulties in terms of determining these or whether these are simply literary borrowings from comedy or whether these were kind of in some sense incorporations through observing contemporary practices of actual mime shows, for example. Um, but in one particular case from a middle Byzantine drama, um, the uh, and you can kind of see from the one example that I choose to cite, and there are not so many examples, why the adoption of the mime show or its elements in the Christian context is actually somewhat challenging. Uh, this particular context is the dialogue between um, the Archangel Gabriel and Mary. Uh, and the particular dialogue casts that particular dialogue and then later on uh, Joseph coming onto the scene. It, it casts that particular dialogue in the mode of a mime dialogue of the adultery mime variety. That is to say, um, um, Gabriel was basically courting Mary and Mary was accepting the courtship of Gabriel, Gabriel being cast as basically the young, young man who's going to seduce the young woman and so on. And after uh, that, um, the, uh, 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 the dialogue went to having Mary announced, announcing to Joseph that she is now with child and Joseph cast now as the uh, jealous old man and so on. And Joseph in this particular part of the dialogue told Mary to go away saying that she's unworthy of being part of his household. And Mary speaks back saying that she will willingly go to her young lover because he, Gabriel is very handsome and so on and so forth. Okay, so, so this is highly, highly suggestive of the kinds of dialogue, you know, uh, uh, that would take place within a kind of mime show. But when you transpose it in this particular context, it is really quite, uh, one might say blasphemous and, and highly inappropriate and so on. So you can kind of see uh, the particular difficulties in somehow finding space within uh, within liturgical services for particular elements of mind performances and so on. Okay. So, so finally, I'd like to uh, summarize, um, skipped over a few things. Um, so Christianity and uh, comedic theater were not at odds in the sense that there was no fundamental categorical difference or opposition. Uh, the mime theater that one can point to were not necessarily so closely tied to traditional forms of worship or beliefs um, that the whole antithesis between Christianity and paganism simply would be a stretch to apply in this particular case. Uh, also, because the mime shows were much less about the uh, performance of these very well-known comedies, uh, these literary comedies on stage, it was also much less about the con interaction between Christianity and Greek paideia and so on. Um, so instead we have the whole contest, the whole tension being surrounded, uh, sort of formed around the issue of the moral effect and the emotional impact of mime shows on the audience, increasingly a Christianized audience. So this is where that uh, uh, sort of quotation from uh, today's talk title, what do you lose if I laugh comes from, it's from one of Jacob Saruk's uh, uh, homilies where he rhetorically, one of his imaginary interlocutors speaks back and say, what, what do you lose if I laugh? You know, why are you opposing mime shows and so on? Uh, and it's somehow uh, sort of meant to be lead, a lead up to Jacob basically saying that, repeating the trope used by John Chrysostom and many others, that laughter is simply inappropriate for a Christian person. Much more appropriate uh, would be 
uh, the attitude of devotion and the demeanor of a penitent and so on. Being, being tearful is much more appropriate uh, for someone, a Christian, to have than uh, someone who's enjoying themselves, laughing all the time and so on. Thank you. So, all right. So this is actually a, uh, so it's on the closing image comes from another diptych of uh, that Anastasius that I uh, started out the lecture with and so on. And on the bottom, you can kind of see a particular detail that I blew up. And this seems to show a particular mime performance with these bald headed mime. You, you see one on the right hand side with a, with a, a kind of crab sort of uh, grasping onto his elongated nose. And of course, in the center, an image of Heracles and so on. Now, clearly, this is a particular scene that invokes the uh, sort of uh, the figure of Heracles uh, in the skit and so on. So this is, of course, in a sixth century uh, 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 context uh, that was still very, very permissible, uh, perhaps even uh, uh, quite hilarious to bring the images of the gods into the public in this particular way. The, the, the comedic theater was a way for people to engage with the past, perhaps the past, also the present, uh, by putting it within a particular comedic register and so on. So this allows the urban dwellers who participate in comedic theater through these mime shows to have a way of interacting with that whole tradition uh, with uh, a kind of humor, but of course, even more so a kind of knowingness or urban savvy that they have a different way, not just the way of a Christian moral teacher wanting people to become penitents and remaining in that particular one uh, mode, uh, that these people have a way to switch between different registers they could compartmentalize their emotions, uh, have different outlooks, and they participate in different forms of subcultures that were still available, uh, particularly in the Christian East. Okay, so so finally, uh, just a quick word of summary: um, how Christians and Christianity engage with the comedic theater was not a linear story and doesn't have a particularly kind of remarkable single outcome that I could point to. Theatres continued, uh, uh, we don't necessarily know what went on in them in places like Constantinople all the way through into the middle of the Byzantine period. Um, we can, however, through looking at uh, perhaps indirectly the culture that the theatre could produce, and this is not necessarily reading the Christian moralist stories for what they say, but reading more between the lines through reader reception and through looking at modern theories of how laughter contributes to community building, emotional communities, and so on. Uh, we could say that perhaps the late Roman comedic stage became a sphere for the reproduction of an urban cultural identity that could be one that stood apart from that cultural community that took place within the Christian churches. And this was in some sense, a fundamentally urban and urbane community and arguably therefore also a secular one. Okay, so I'll just end here. Sorry, I went over. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Richard, for this panoramic overview. And thank you for uh, your effort to address uh, a diverse uh, audience. I'm sure now there will be many questions uh, from um, our audience. Uh, so the floor is uh, is uh, is yours. Please um, raise uh, use the raise hand uh, uh, button or um, write uh, in the in the chat in the chat bubble. <clears throat> 
anyone who would like to ask? So I just go back to go one image over, which yeah. is all right. Mm -hmm. That that whole image that we started out with from uh, the uh, Catherine Nixie's uh, book. This is yeah. one way to, in some sense, engage with an an image of a pagan deity, right? And here's one other one. <laughs> and so this provides, uh, I think, hopefully, an interesting contrast for what's possible and so on. Mm -hmm. That's true. Um, anyone who would like to ask, uh, put a question? Um, perhaps I would um, ask for um, for a comment. Um, you didn't say anything about um, secularism, and it's a, it's a key uh, term, and uh, it would be nice to um, tell us a bit more how this this um, concept um, uh, comes in uh, regarding uh, the comedic uh, acts and shows. And also, uh, it would be important, I guess, to see if you, to say a few things about the position of the state, of the imperial uh, attitude toward uh, these uh, shows, which was uh, not the same as the that of the Christian uh, church. There were, I would I would say, two separate uh, concepts, two attitudes. So. Could you please comment on on these two points? Yeah, thank you. Um, so, in some sense, the thank thank you. It's a great question. Uh, two questions. Uh, the whole notion of the secular is, in some sense, that whole category that is neither Christianized or Christianizable. You know, couldn't really be sanctified, appropriate for a Christian religious use. Uh, nor is it so objectionable, considered idolatrous or quote-unquote pagan in such a way as to be uh, something that has to be totally discarded. So things that are sort of somehow in the middle category I would consider secular. So in this particular case I, I would see, and this goes to your second question, uh, the, the, the whole investment of the society from the elite down to quite ordinary uh, citizens, uh, including Christians and so on, who are invested in having uh, particular forms of shared communal life that were not necessarily ones that were uh, sanctified and taking place spatially within either within the church or as part of processions and so on. There were, in some sense, things that could uh, uh, remind them, for example, that they lived in a Roman city. And that's, in some sense, very much the uh, the attraction, I think, of these particular forms of entertainments because they were part of that urban identity, that civic identity, uh, which, you know, particularly in the East, remained vibrant and strongly supported and so on. So where the state comes in, of course, this particular image of the consular diptych, you know, the emperors, consuls, uh, others were invested in maintaining that because that is very much important, uh, central to in this case, to their Roman identity, the whole notion of the Romanitas, uh, even in the East and so on, uh, is has to do with the ability to reproduce that way of life. Um, and you can't get away easily from those obligations, in part because you have stone architecture <laughs> that reminds you that something needs to take place in the Hippodrome, in the theatre, and there are fewer empty theaters in the East, but, you know, um, or purpose-built ones. Uh, so you're, you're, you're being kind of given this re daily reality of having these monuments that, that almost cry out to be filled. And this is arguably why, in some sense, uh, the mime shows became uh, hereditary uh, kind of professions because they, uh, they were very frequent and then, you know, they did... Uh, People didn't want the traveling mime groups to just disappear. You know, they they had to tie them down to service major urban communities and so on. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, we have a question from um, our colleague Valentina Di Napoli. Valentina, Siakume. Uh, 
Uh, hi. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Lim, for your uh, great overview. I must confess I have never thought that mime and Christianity could uh, intersect, uh, not even in later, I mean, periods, and it was really illuminating. Uh, I, I would like to have some comments about uh, if you think that the presence of female performance performers, both in mime and in pantomime, if I'm correct, uh, did have any kind of influence about the perception such performances had. Um, and also, if you can comment a little bit further about the, the possibility of mimes being performed within um, uh, hippodromes. I mean, I have never remarked that such uh, representations uh, occur in the very same, uh, just a, re a register below the hippodrome uh, uh, displays. And this is the first time I, I noticed this. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so absolutely, so the female mimes and the male mimes, um, it's less, uh, I, I, that's a really good instinct to ask that question, I, and I'm trying to answer it as best I can. I, what I seem to uh, find is more, um, I wouldn't say anxiety, but more questions about uh, the problems posed by when male mimes uh, reenact female roles, as I say, the, the whole concern is in some sense on a largely still male audience of theatrical shows and how watching males taking on the demeanor, the dress, the, the gestures of a female, these sensuous motions could lead them to a form of mimesis that is actually very bad for their morality. And so, so the whole accusation of uh, effeminacy and so on. Um, so, so even though I, I would think that, you know, if having an actual uh, uh, sort of uh, naturally born female mime on stage could similarly evoke uh, that kind of uh, uh, sexualized response and so on. But what I'm finding in the literature is sort of more concerned with that other form of supposedly transgression and so on. Uh, so in regards to the, um, the mimes appearing in the Hippodrome, again, I, one wouldn't want to ever say never because there's always got to be evidence, but I'm sort of uh, thinking about, of course, the, um, the whole phenomenon of uh, theatrical clacks and how they, in some sense, intersected with the circus clacks uh, and so on. The, the sort of those people who are responsible for leading the cheering in the Hippodrome uh, you know, similarly organized as the theatrical clacks and so on. We also, of course, have the, the base of the Theodosian obelisk, where we have dancers who are basically trying to kind of, uh, kind of using flags, what have you, kind of to make, make particular gestures and so on. So, so, so I, think, I think one could see a uh, possibility of some of these things happening within the space of the Hippodrome. Of course, the Hippodrome being such a large, space is not really very conducive to the types of performances that require dialogue to appreciate. Of course, not all mimes require dialogue. You could have perfectly good, funny, physical skits uh, without any real dialogue and so on. Uh, but of course, you know, that's not the entirety of what mime shows provided. So, so there could be these physical skits, but they wouldn't in any way, I think, replace the possibility of mime shows being much more fully performed in the theater or other similar spaces like the Odeon and so on. Thank you, thank you very much. Thank you, Valentina. Someone else would like to ask? Yeah, uh, Nicoletta Canavu. Yeah, Nicoletta. Thank you, Yara. Uh, thank you, uh, Professor Lim, for this panorama of late antique intersections between uh, um, well, Christian and pagan tastes, Christian and pagan aesthetics. I was very struck by uh, your mention of that mime featuring the Virgin Mary, uh, Gabriel and Joseph. Um, and I would 
I would like to hear a bit more about it. Um, to, to my ears, it, 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 sound, it sounded analogous with um, apocryphal narratives of the type of Paul and Thecla, to mention one very famous example. Um, I mean, this, um, this idea that a story is made which has Christian characters but is based on, on, pagan, on, on pagan tastes. And it is addressed to whom? I mean, Paul and Thecla um, also have a recognized flirtatious, even erotic element, which may well be stronger and perhaps more ridiculous, comedic, as, as you say, in, in the mind. Um, yeah, I, I was interested in your thoughts about this. If you think that, um, well, these two ways of um, merging Christian and uh, pagan material are related to each other in, in, any, in any way. In, uh, yes, and, um, yes, this, this mimic dialogue, is it an actual text? Thank you. I'm actually looking forward to your talk on erotic novels and so on. So, so hopefully you, you would tell us more about those intersections. And it's certainly the case that when, again, I, you know, I, you know I, I don't go so late into the Byzantine period, so I'm relying on others and so on, like La Piana and so on. Um, so some of the sources of sort of Byzantine drama, church drama, uh, the Apocrypha is definitely uh, you know, and these novels definitely one of them, and indirectly, of course, therefore the novels of a major source. You know, in addition to uh, hymns and uh, sort of of Ephraim and others and uh, Romanus and so on. So, so there's definitely that particular element. Um, but where I, where I, what I see is in some sense I could see the plots being similar, right? I mean, and then you have these plots that are shared from novels to. To, to comedy, to, to new comedy, to, to these various kinds of mimes, to, you know, uh, to Christian apocryphal acts and so on. So, so that's, that's um, I think I, I can see that as a continuum that makes a lot of sense. You know, people wanted narratives and, you know, all these stories have a very powerful narrative element that's very attractive to ancient and modern audiences and so What's in some sense a little bit uh, striking when I came across that, that whole dialogue is that it's not so much the plot itself, but the the use of the adultery mime, of course, itself is also commonly shared across those genres, subgenres, the novels included, and so on. But it's really, in some sense, the the mimic dialogue, you know, the the kind of dialogue that is so somewhat shockingly kind of um, somewhat rude I would say you know it, particularly within a context where presumably Marian veneration was very very important you know you, you know and having that very transgressive language reapplied from one context to another but finding very inappropriate people through whom you wish to have those same words spoken is it, just just very shocking Oh, yes, thank you. Thank you both. Uh, any more questions? Any more? Yeah. Pablo Zemergis, Pablo Sakume. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Professor, for your uh, speech. I have to ask uh, something. We talked about uh, the celebrity status that uh, pantomimes had uh, in this uh, era. Do we have uh, information about uh, uh, you, about pantomimes that used this uh, uh, against uh, Christianity and uh, uh, their uh, and their uh, um, and their acolytes and their uh, followers. Yes. Um, oh, sorry. Yes, I mean uh, these were, were not necessarily people who were not 
uh, religious. Often they do would have religious professions, and in some sense, this is where those whole the, the, all those conversion narratives come in. And and both pantomimes and mimes, they are conversion narratives that built around their supposed conversion to Christianity, and sometimes even martyrdom. Uh, you know, if if that was set in a context in which martyrdom was was allowed, that is to say, in a pre-Constantinian period. Um, we have um, uh, also uh, people who were kind of mantrantized, and including other performers who were active members of Christian communities who would take particular roles uh, and so on. So, so there's nothing inherently incompatible, uh, although, you know, question mark, I guess I should say, uh, uh, these people could find themselves as parts of Christian communities and so on. Now, the difference often is sort of between what could be done as a catechumen and what could be done as a baptized Christian. And this is where, in some sense, most of the Christian authors tend to sort of draw the line from Tertullian onwards. Uh, baptism was supposed to put an end to some of these things such as performing in public and so on. So, so that kind of lead, led, leads me to think that, you know, you could continue in this way of life so long as you don't become baptized. And we know emperors do the same thing. So, so that's somehow uh, the way to, uh, to do it. Um, <clears throat> we have, um, um, and going back to people playing a particular role, I didn't mention the uh, other, um, <clears throat> sorry, other narratives, including the uh, story of Saint Pelagia of Antioch, uh, which is built on a story that Chrysostom told uh, about a woman who's without a name, but was later on then kind of reworked into tradition about Pelagia, who was supposedly either a porne or a uh, or mime actress, very famous in Antioch, well beloved by everyone. And one day she actually came into the church, so she would go to church, uh, and she heard the preaching of the local bishop, and she became so moved that she asked for baptism, and she was baptized. So she was a catechumen, and she became baptized Christian, at which point she actually left her old life and supposedly went to Jerusalem and became a recluse, uh, and famously did so, you know, famously in the sense that she went away, disappeared, but supposedly lived out the rest of her life as a male, uh, male dressed uh, ascetic. And so, so she went through the whole transvestite process, you know, that males often cross dress as women on the stage. Uh, she did it the opposite way when she became a baptized Christian. So this doesn't fully answer your question, but it sort of addresses that whole, uh, I think hopefully that, that whole issue of pan, uh, supposedly actors were at least imagined uh, to have uh, a particular place within the Christian community. Thank you very much, again. Any more questions? Either in the chat or uh, orally? In the meantime, I could ask uh, something more, uh, Professor Lim. Um, uh, you you mentioned uh, at some point uh, the word uh, frequency, and I'm wondering, uh, to, to, to some extent, these performances were associated uh, in the imperial period uh, uh, with uh, pagan festivals, right, beside the any kind of uh, festivities uh, related to the imperial the, the imperial cult. So I'm wondering, after uh, Constantine, after the demise of uh, pagan uh, festivals, or uh, the reduce of of of, uh, of, of them, uh, what other occasions uh, were um, on offer for for the these uh, shows, and um, could one say that uh, in, in late antiquity there were more uh, investment uh, in, uh, in these shows on, on the part of, of, of the state, of the Roman state, 
Uh, yeah. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so we have, uh, of course, from, I mean, certainly the connection between theatrical shows and festivals is, is very well stated. I mean, that, that's certainly one of the very important connections. Um, we have in the case of, you know, it's certainly well, well documented throughout the empire in the East, uh, uh, the agonistic festivals and so on, um, and also in Egypt from Papari. Um, in the case of Rome, we have the famous calendar of 354, uh, in which, you know, of the various types of festivals that have games attached to them, uh, there were, within, within the year, there were 101 days with, as I, if I recall correctly, with theatrical shows and so on. So Ludi Skeniki and so on, uh, as opposed to uh, something like 30 days of circus races, hippodrome races, and about 10 days of gladiatorial games and so on. So that's the, you know, it, taking a mid fourth century context, this is what we see in this particular case. Now, of course, these were just mainly the main festivals uh, and the events associated with them. Um, there is some evidence, and I try to kind of look into it in uh, elsewhere, in in the case of Rome and in Carthage, where at the end of the fourth century, in the early fifth century, um, it was said that theatrical shows were actually put on every day or almost every day, and so you know they were at sort of daily occurrences and so on. So this, in some sense, uh, precludes the idea that it has to be a festival for there to be a theatrical show to be produced, and they were much more kind of uh, uh, staffed as if they were urban amenities. They were, you know, basically they were things that a properly managed city ought to have uh, and they could be, you know, uh, run on that basis. And this is arguably why the permanent staffing, you know, uh, of these shows was important. That there's an, an, a particular Roman official, the Tribunus Voluptatum, that was set in place in Rome and in Carthage to, force, to oversee the, the, act, the actors for, for this uh, for this urban stage and so um, as for um, so I was just going to say um, okay so so I'm thinking that uh, there doesn't necessarily need to have a uh, religious festival as sort of part of the event um, we know that for example the 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 Italian the Atalani you know earlier of course the starting in uh, in in Campania, the Oscan plays and so on, they began perhaps as being rustic entertainment during rustic day, uh, rustic holidays and market days in city, the Nundinai in Rome, for example, and these were run on the nine every nine days, you know, in Rome. So, so they, they, they could be also the the market day connection, you know, if it's not a weekly thing, it could be some other, you know. So. You have, of course, the major cycle of festival market days, but you also you have the other other cycles that run, you know, increasingly around the week, for example. Right. So maybe more more uh, possibilities of uh, comedic uh, uh, performances in late antiquity than 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 before, or yeah, uh, yeah, good, yeah, yeah. Good question. I think one one of the things that uh, seem to come across is that pantomime shows were incredibly expensive to carry uh, for, for whatever reason. You know, pantomimes were celebrities. When Symmachus was begging the emperor to kind of basically, uh, you know, uh, support the Roman spectacles more as he had promised, he asked particularly for horse, horses, charioteers, uh, horses and, and pantomimes and so on. So these were the ones that were sort of very expensive to put on. Local resources don't extend to producing these resources and so on, you know, whereas, you know, perhaps you could have a mime troupe that was basically hired on a yearly basis. You know, there, there are yearly contracts that we found in Egypt from an earlier period, for example, for 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 mimes. Um, you know, all these people will have, have to stay on, you know, they were, they were always available. They, they could always, you could always find seven people <laughs> to go on a, mm. a mime show and they don't need necessarily to be very good. <laughs> so, Whereas a pantomime might have to be very good. This is before, you know, any kind of lip syncing, of course. Um, so, yeah. so, so theatrical shows might be, and I'm trying to try to get at your question, uh, might be in some sense a much more, shall we say, sustainable kind of Roman spectacle. You needed to put on spectacle a lot 
frequently for a urban audience. Chariot games were expensive. Gladiatorial games with animals, animal games. These Very are all expensive. Yeah. yeah. Whereas mime shows, you know, they go back to these traveling troops, and you could kind of dip in and out of that particularly very low base of logistics, if you will. Yeah. And it's more or less, you know, they you can know. be invited to a party. They can be, yeah, they can perform um, at the market, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, yeah. yeah. Exactly. All right. Yes, uh, this is very good. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, a last call for uh, questions from the audience. If not, uh, I would like to thank you a lot for this uh, wonderful uh, presentation. It was a great uh, privilege uh, for us all. And um, I I'm looking forward to seeing you all uh, again uh, next week. Uh, next week, uh, same day and same time, we uh, have the paper by Dr. Ioannis Papadopoulos on uh, Rome uh, in the 4th century and uh, the emerging power of the, um, of the uh, church. Uh, so with that, I would like uh, to thank you all and uh, say farewell and goodbye and see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you.